and gentlemen, I think, I think we're, we're just about on 6.30, so I think I'll begin this evening's proceedings. Um, first of all, I'll introduce myself. I'm Denise Leavesley. Uh, I'm Dean of the Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy that DEPS, the Department of Education and Professional Studies, sits within. Um, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome everybody to this lecture this evening, particularly to welcome those of you who um, are former students or staff of, of King's and visitors to, to King's. So you're very welcome and we hope you enjoy this evening. I have um, two very pleasurable roles this evening. Um, I'm going to, in a few minutes, introduce the speaker. Um, but before that, it's an opportunity for me to say just a few words about the Department of Education and Professional Studies after seven very happy years of working with them. Um, there's many, many things I could say in celebration of the department. The wide range of stimulating programs that they run and teach, their commitment <coughs> to providing a quality environment for students at all levels, undergraduate, uh, postgraduate taught, PGCE, and postgraduate researchers. Um, the willingness to challenge orthodoxies and to speak truth to power. The very warm and collegiate atmosphere set at all levels, but especially promoted by the head of the department, Sharon Gewurz. But in a year where we've obtained the very impressive REF result, I shouldn't lean on that, should I? Um, it would be uh, inappropriate for me not to take this opportunity to c congratulate the department on this really amazing result. So DEPS was ranked second out of 76 institutions. I'm not going to say who came first, because people might think I was biased. So second out of 76 institutions on grade point average for quality. That's truly exceptional. Um, and I hope that you'll take time to read about it in the, the orange brochure that's been uh, produced talking about the research of the department. That brochure also demonstrates the importance of the value of research in making a difference to education policy and education practice. Um, one of the things that I'm really impressed by is that impact is not rhetoric manufactured for external accountability, but it runs throughout the ethos of the department. So I'd just like to give my warm thanks to everybody within the department, professional services staff, um, academic staff, and the students for making it such a vibrant and exciting day. So my second role is to turn to tonight's lecture. Um, I always look forward to the annual education lecture. I've enjoyed every single one of them, and I know I'm going to enjoy this evening's too. They broaden our perspective. A lot of work goes into them behind the scenes too, and I think I should thank uh, colleagues for the organization of tonight's lecture. So Nacho, who, who did a lot of the administrative work, Jenny Driscoll, who was head of the External Relations Committee, is doing sterling work on raising the profile and the outreach Tonight's uh, event has been coordinated by our very trusty and hard hardworking departmental manager, Ben Day. So the speaker for this evening, and I'm really pleased that it's an old friend of mine, so that's a lovely, a lovely double bonus, <coughs> is Professor Danny Dorling. Danny is a social geographer, and he's been the Humphrey McKinder Professor of Geography in the School of Geography and Environment at the University of Oxford almost two years now. Prior to that, he's had an academic career that's included posts in Newcastle, the University of Bristol, Leeds, Sheffield, the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, and a visiting professorship at Goldsmiths, um, University of London. His work, as many of you will know, focuses on mapping spatial and social inequalities in housing, health, employment, wealth and poverty, and how they can be challenged. 
read out a list of his books um, because that would take a long time. He's an academician, he's a fellow of the terminology has changed, of the Academy of the Learning Society of the Social Sciences. He's honorary president of the Society of Photographers and patron of Road Keys, the national charity of the Road Crash Victims. Tonight's lecture coincides with a revised edition of his book, Injustice, Why Social Equality Inequality Still Persists. It was described by Matthew Taylor, the chief executive of the RSA, as a brilliant analysis of the nature of inequality in the UK and a must read for anyone who wants to understand inequality and how we might tackle it. With colleagues, Danny has created a website, worldmapper.org, which provides maps of global inequalities. His work has attracted a lot of public attention, and he speaks regularly at public events and on TV and radio. And he's also been advisor to many policy organizations, and is increasingly engaging uh, with and addressed by, or to use sought by, policy makers. So I couldn't think of a better person to give this lecture this evening, and Warmly welcome, Danny Dorling. I'm sorry for jumping on the Thank you very much, Denise, for that. Can you hear me at the back okay? Great. Um, this is a picture of my dad. Um, and I want you to tell me afterwards whether you think I am beginning to look like him. Uh, I'm aging. There's a picture of me a few years ago, and I'm afraid I have to use these. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to read a whole lecture out, but just one bit I, I do need uh, to read. Uh, before I do that, what I've chosen to do this evening is take what I think is the most interesting part of this book called Injustice. It's the bit which I had to update the most in doing uh, the second edition of the book, which has just come out. And it may be the most contentious part, and it's certainly the part that has got most to do with education, so it fitted for this lecture. And it's about the word potential and theories of potential. Because when you begin to look at the persistence of inequality, particularly the persistence of inequality in the most unequal of rich nations, and we are heading that way, the USA currently is winning the global race to be the most unequal of large rich nations, uh, but I'm afraid we're on track at some point in the next 20 years to overtake it, the way things are going. When inequalities are this high, it's hard to work out why they are this high and, and what sustains them. And what I did in Injustice was to look behind the reports and rhetoric of many people to try to find out whether they thought inequality was a bad thing or not. And there is a group of people who actually think that the inequalities that we have in this country are partly a natural expression of people's innate differences. And it helps that group of people justify uh, what they do. It certainly helps people at the top of the Conservative Party at the moment. And I have lots and lots of quotes uh, in Injustice uh, from people who are currently cabinet ministers. When they reveal in, in fairly obscure speeches what they really believe about the nature of human beings, which helps us explain why they do what they do. But first of all, let me just read you this. Some of you may think that you've come to listen to somebody with a brilliant mind, a celebrated Oxford professor, no less. However, there is a problem. I haven't got a brilliant mind. I'm not good at writing. Much that has been published with my name on it has been rewritten by many other people. I was a very slow reader. I still am, as you can tell as I try to read this out. I'm not bad at mathematics, but I'm not exceptionally good. I do manage to remember a lot of statistics, but no more than many people remember about their favorite sport. Other than that, my memory is poor. I'm a non-starter when it comes to other languages. I do work much harder than I need to, which may be exceptional in academia once you get your foot on the ladder. However, I do not work much harder than many men 
in low-wage jobs, and I probably do not work as hard as most women in Britain do. In many ways, I am of average ability. Now, before you go away saying what a modest person I am, I have to admit that my dad wrote this bit, and he wrote it because it is true. And the purpose of my lecture is to show you how that or something very similar to it has to be true. None of us are actually that special. Meet Toby. Uh, I've never met Toby. Uh, Toby lives down in Auckland, and Toby's a cartoonist. A year or so ago, Toby met somebody called Max, and Max writes about inequality in New Zealand. Uh, Toby hadn't thought about the kind of ideas that Max thinks about, but when Max explained to him what was going on in New Zealand, a pretty unequal country, not as unequal as we are, Toby became interested in it, so interested that he produced a couple of series of cartoons. These cartoons went viral in the last few months. They've gone viral around the world. You may well have seen them, but I'm going to use them to try to make uh, the points I've got to make. Uh, they're about a boy and a girl, and the boy's called Richard, and the girl's called Paula. And it's uh, pencil swords, or pencil wo pencils words is where it is if you want to find it. And here they are. This is Richard, and this is Paula. And it's about what happens to them. Now there'll be a huge range of factors about what determines their life chances. I could have shown you lots of tables and lots of graphs and lots of figures, but I'm not going to do that. What they're going to do is use this series of cartoons, and then I'll just talk over them to make the point. The vast majority of the factors that matter for the future of these two little babies have to do with the nature of society in which they're born. Had they been born somewhere other than New Zealand, or had they been born at another time in New Zealand, say in the 1920s? New Zealand invented the first welfare state in the 1930s before we invented a one. Had they been born in a different place or a different time, their trajectories would be very different. We know that because we know the outcomes of society. But because these two fictional characters were born about 20 years ago in New Zealand, the range of possibilities for what they can turn out like is much wider. Most of what affects them are societal. But of course, there may be individual uh, factors that also matter. And this really dogs the potential debate. If you imagine for a moment that they weren't Richard and Paula, but were Richard and Paul, and were actually identical twins separated at birth, uh, then they would look the same. And that would let us take out the influence of whether one of them was prettier than the other one. And I'll, I'll go on about this a bit later. This kind of story will be so familiar to you story of one child growing up in a family with lots of resources and another growing up in a family without many resources, that you don't need to see the figures and the evidence that says just how important it is. But in Britain we tend to forget the huge differences that there are between people in different groups. We tend to be obsessed by very, very individual things, or things we can think we can have an effect on. So I'll give you one example. There's a kind of middle class obsession with summer born boys. Uh, we tend to worry, well, we, I've got a summer born boy. We tend to worry about our summer born boys because we know that boys born in summer will tend to fall behind in school more than other boys and certainly more than girls who do better than boys nowadays. But the amount by which boys who are born in summer fall behind is absolutely trivial compared to just being a boy in a slightly poorer family. The difference between families by wealth or families by area by wealth is orders of magnitude greater than the effect of being born at different times of the year. But you feel stuck in your social 
position. You feel stuck in your social class. You know, you've got that, you can't alter it very much. But you could choose to have sex at a different time of the year if you, if you were really statistical. Nobody need have a summer born boy anymore. Uh, I think it's very nice to see that lots of summer born boys are still born, so the population isn't that obsessive. About context and change, here we've got Paula, and one problem that Paula has is that she doesn't see much of her parents because her parents, each of them, or her one parent, and are doing two jobs. We're now in an era where people have to do two jobs, in the US people often do three jobs, uh, just to get by. That wasn't the case a generation or two generations ago. All about the context and the changing context that we're living in. We know that schools matter. Here the school teacher is, is drawn. They're there for the same person. You take the same teacher and put them in one school as opposed to another, and it's so much easier to do a better job in one school as opposed to another. I'm, I'm talking to people in education, so I hardly need to tell you this. Um, all I'll say, one interesting thing from moving from Sheffield to Oxford, is that in Sheffield I knew lots of teachers of my age. I moved to Oxford, and I've been to a lot of schools in Oxford in the last two years. In most of the schools, there are hardly any teachers of my age. In a lot of the schools, there are hardly any <coughs> teachers aged over 25, because they get sick of losing all their income in rent, and they leave. <coughs> most of the heads I've met in Oxford are younger than me. Um, it isn't easy to be a teacher in Oxford and to stay in Oxford because of the house prices. And so that affects what happens to the school. There's some text there you can read about how people look and the effects on that because these kind of things may also matter. We tend to judge people uh, by their looks. Uh, there are studies of this, of course. There are famous old 1960s studies about how West Indian children are treated differently. There are much more recent studies about when teachers are asked what they think of children, we find that uh, the ones that they think are slower, they tend to judge being slower and they tend to treat their children in a different way and that has an effect on the children. I think we need much more work being done on, on how people look and how we treat people by how they look. The way we could do that work is actually by looking at identical twins. The problem is that identical twin studies don't tend to look to look at the effects of, of your visual appearance. They tend to be trying to look for other things. Grades are a recent invention. The idea of grading people, of having exams, so many exams, is very, very recent. Uh, when I went to school, there were no tests. No tests until I was 16. Our obsession with testing at the moment is very new. Uh, we're about to test, I think, all four and five-year-olds in English state schools in September. We're going to baseline test them. Now, you can look at groups of children and use tests to make predictions about them. Any individual four or five-year-old, your tests are going to be incredibly unreliable. When you're looking at what happens to people, series of things happen to them. Each one may appear to be small, but they build up. Individually, chance matters enormously. If you think about all your lives, what's happened to you, how you come to be sitting in this lecture bit tonight, there were chance events. You'll all be able to say what the chance events were, um, but you all have your own individual story. And then on top of those chance events, and they could be good luck or bad luck, uh, there will be your social position. What happened to you? Whether somebody gave you a leg up? Were you sent to a school in which most people went on to university or a different kind of school? Did you get that job because somebody helped you get that job and put you in a position to know how to do it? 
Or are you in a different kind of a job because nobody actually helped you at that stage? And so you're in a slightly lower grade position. And it's not about you, it's about the circumstances that you found yourself in. For young people today, the kind of questions are, did somebody find you an unpaid internship so that you could work in London and get a foot on the ladder? Much more importantly, is there somebody who's going to lend you £40,000 to give you a chance of buying that really, really awful flat in Barking and Dagenham <laughs> that without £40,000 you haven't got the hope in hell of getting? And that's the difference between somebody who decides that their long-term career is going to be in London and somebody who leaves. Young people know this in London now, and they're angry about it. They really don't like the idea that where you are going to get to in, in life, your potential, depends increasingly on your parents' wealth and not how well you work. They're kind of sold with the idea of meritocracy. Meritocracy is great because we've tested them so much. We've given young people the idea that they differ in ability, and if you work hard, you should be rewarded. And so it's particularly annoying uh, to enter a world in fact it doesn't matter how hard you work if you can't buy that flat you know you really have to go up at some point because landlords some are nice most are not nice um, and as soon as you start a family you cannot carry on with private landlords in London and be in a happy situation because they'll increase the rent you can't pay it you've got to move and your children Let's keep taking you through Toby's slides. Um, I like these slides. I think they help explain a lot of things that social scientists spend a long time trying to explain very, very uh, simply. Of course, it's all much more complicated than that, so that's why you have to write a book. Uh, I had a... <laughs> well, that's the excuse for writing a book and not a paper. I wrote a short book called Inequality of the 1%, which details some of this, but injustice really is packed with everything I can find. And as far as I can see, and as far as I can test by testing out these arguments with other people, we have so much more potential to think and to dream and become better than we are collectively. We don't sit as atomized individuals, each becoming mini geniuses if we can on our own, reproducing in groups. That's how we work. The idea of a meritocracy in which there are a set of individuals and you can keep on training and grading them and eventually find a few golden children and project them up to the top, completely ignores the fact that we do things well when we do them together. Just like producing a book. The book is produced by dozens of people. Lots of copy editors, proofreaders, editors, people who sell it, friends who read the drafts of what you've written, people who teach you what you learned that first gave you your bias that you often can't lose for the rest of your life. You know, it, it's an incredible collective effort. And then you do this stupid thing of sticking somebody's name on the front cover to make it look as if it's all about them. Now, somebody has to take responsibility, but if you could just see the very first draft of anything that's written, particularly by somebody like me, the difference between that and what you finally see is enormous. And I often feel really sorry for university students because when they're reading papers or books, they don't realize that this isn't something that somebody's just potted out. Um, these things really are polished. Nobody could actually do this on their own. And it's not just true of books, it's true of everything. It's true of this microphone. It's certainly true of this computer. Nobody can make a computer nowadays. You can't do it. You can't make a television on your own. Things are produced collaboratively. My eyesight really is going with age. I'm going to leave these glasses on. What happens to you later? What happens when somebody promotes you or doesn't promote you? Or what happens when somebody bullies you at work? And the, and the effect that has on you? And why does it happen? And how do you decide when you interview three people for an undergraduate place at Oxford? Or five people for a lectureship at King's? which one to take? Is it all based on merit? The 
three people going to the undergraduate degree at Oxford after all are remarkably similar. A star, A star, A. Um, I'll never forget a student when I was up at Sheffield on an open day saying to me, what kind of students come here to the job department at Sheffield? And um, she'd just come over the Pennines from Bolton and had ABB predicted A level and was wearing some fairly sporty clothes. And I had to say to her, I'm afraid they tend to have AAB at A level, tend to live just over the Pennines in the northwest of England, and tend to wear fairly sporty clothes. Yeah, you know, because that's the way we've heard people together in education. Similarly for that job interview, for that lectureship here, the five people you interview will be very similar to each other. They'll all have got a PhD, otherwise you wouldn't interview them. They'll all have got some papers, they'll all have a chance to job. You might when you're sitting there on the interview panel, say, oh, they're much better than they're a lot of point for and so on. But I'm now old enough to have watched my entire, almost my entire cohort of PhD students from the 1980s get a job. All of us who competed for those different jobs who are being interviewed against each other at various universities, partly because there are so few of us and there are actually more jobs in the future, we've all ended up professors now. But on the way to doing that, we were all being graded at various points, not very good, unappointable, brilliant, or whatever. But we were similar. So which ones do you go for? Who, who gets it? And again, that's where I think it would be interesting to look at the effects of looks, at whether people with particularly chiseled cheekbones or people who are thinner um, are more likely to get the university appointment, the studentship, or whatever. Um, brilliant undergraduates are remarkably thin at Oxford, that's all I'll say. You know, if it's entirely on merit, why aren't some of the A star, A star, A people who are slightly larger sizes? Anyway, I, won't, I must not get myself into trouble about these things. I think we need to look. Our potential is limited by our cultures. A really good example of this is language. As my dad's told you, I am utterly useless at languages. It's not an innate thing about me. There isn't something in my genes that means I can't do language. I was born in England in 1968. Right? Some of the others of you have this experience. Do you remember doing that bit of French when you were about 14? What you were made to do in those language labs? The idea that you stick this thing on your head and that will teach you another language. Right. We are utterly abysmal at languages. Uh, my mum and dad have a couple of friends uh, who they made friends with because they were locked up in the Campsfield Detention Centre in Oxford, came from Rwanda. They could speak four languages. It wasn't impressive. It was normal. That's what you do in most of Africa. You speak several languages. The ability to speak language, and I think it's the same with music and even maths, most of it is cultural. Or another anecdote. I was at a wedding a few years ago, and I was standing next to somebody from Brazil, and she was watching everybody dance at this wedding. And she leant over to me and she said, you English, you teach your children to swim, but you don't teach them to dance. Um, <laughs> There is nothing inherent in being English that means you cannot dance at a wedding. Okay? It's, it's cultural, I'm afraid. We could, it may take decades, if not centuries, to get to the position where we can dance again. Um, but we don't take it as seriously as other places. Inequality is created and maintained and defended by the theory that different people have greatly different worth, that their children have hugely varying potential. And because their children have hugely varying potentials, we need different schools for them to go to. We need some schools which will cost as much as £35,000 a year to educate a child, another 15000 for the school trips. The only way you can defend that, I think, is that you have entrance examinations, say at 13, and you just let in the ones who could benefit from a, such a supposedly wonderful education. 
And because you're spending so much money on such a small number of children, we spend about 25% of our secondary education spending, public and private, on just 7% of children, and most of that just on a minority of those 7%. Because you're spending so much on a small number of children, you're going to spend less on other children. And if you think this is a good thing, you have to think, well, those children are never going to be up to much. But then you could think, oh, that could be a bit mean. Supposing there was a child who goes to that badly funded school who could do a lot. Let's go looking for them. Let's give them a baseline test at age four or five, just to spot whether they are there. And if they do particularly well at age four and five, let's push their teacher to push them further and set targets that are higher. And search the few able ones out from the masses so that they can join our children, who are all destined to be brilliant, because our children, of course, are really gifted. Very, very, very clever. It surprised me how clever my children were. Um, it's not a normal way to think or behave. It doesn't happen to this extent in most of the rest of this continent. There are problems and differences and gradings of educational systems in the rest of this continent. But nowhere has the kind of segregation that we have, by whether your mum or dad can actually afford to pay the fees. Nowhere else in Europe touches it. If you want to compare cities, compare Oxford and Bonn, they're twins, German city and English city, and compare the schools. It takes quite a long time and several bottles of beer to get a German school teacher from Bonn to actually rank the schools in the city of Bonn because none of them are about that bad and none of them are that brilliant. And the private school, private school, it's not for the clever kids. It's for the rather slow children of the extremely rich who have trouble in the mainstream schools. And what every German knows, and hardly anybody here knows, is that the most famous alumni of that school in Bonn, near Bonn, is Prince Philip. Because I've been immersed in this debate now for about 10 years, my friends who think I am too much of a hippie repeatedly send me papers about genetic effects, genetic effects being found, and, and so on. Gene studies are changing rapidly. It's only 2010 that somebody produced a statistical method to analyze genome-wide effects. So we, I'm sure these kind of things might come up in the, in the question, so I'll leave it for later. But the most important thing to, to know about genetic effects is that we are only very recently getting genome-wide studies. They're showing very small effects that are smaller than the gap between boys and girls at age. People are trying to do analysis of nature and nurture, and they're doing it at King's. This is figure two from a paper I sent this week, and I'm just going to put it up for you. It's supposedly the nurture effects on ADHD. Okay. So it's, a, it's an attempt, I think, I could have got it wrong, and if I have, I, I apologize, but as far as I can tell, reading the description of the figure, and I think you'll tell what the figure is, this figure was put in the paper to demonstrate an attempt to look at nature and nurture effects, and this is the nurture effect on ADHD. Now, I'm not very good at writing or reading, but I've drawn more maps of Britain than anybody has ever drawn in British history because I am weird. I've, done, I've drawn thousands and thousands of maps of Britain. So when I see a map of Britain and I see a pattern, I try to work out what pattern does it look like that I've seen before. And there's only one pattern that I've seen that looks like that before, and I'll show it in a minute. But essentially, unless the BT Tower is sending out some kind of radioactive signal, which has an amazing effect that is almost purely circular, that, that cannot be the nurture effect on ADHD. Um, the pattern it's most similar to is a thing called population potential that comes from human geography that has nothing to do with educational potential. It's just a measure of how many people are near you. Um, but it's similar. We are at, an in we're at the very infancy of looking at genome-wide effects. We've had twin studies for a very long time, but identical twins 
<coughs> look like each other. You can't have identical twins that do not look like each other, and how you look has an effect on how people treat you. If we had an identical twin study in a country where they wear the veil, then maybe we could, we could look at that differently, but we do not. Um, these studies are very important for many things. They're extremely important for working out the genetics of being obese and fat. And some of us have genes that mean that unless you lock us up in a small room and slide cabbage underneath the door, put you in an obesogenic environment and you're going to get fat, and there'll be luckily ones about among you are the other way inclined. Right? Genes matter for all kinds of things. There are lots of genetic effects. But education and knowledge is much different and complicated. Um, I sometimes look at the work that's, that's done on genes and education. I think, would somebody do this for flower arranging? Would you try and work out the genes that make somebody better at flower arranging than somebody else? Right? Flower arranging is a socially constructive skill. It depends on whether you ever come across it and whether you're trained or not. There were very big biases, tends to involve more women than men. WI particularly into it, you know. But you could, if you really wanted to, get hold of the DNA and try to work out who was the best flower arranger. And it's not particularly helpful. Um, because we're not atomized individuals. We really are not, if you've seen the film The Matrix, we are not a set of people sitting in tubs you know, with a tube in us sucking out our ability and energy to imagine, and it really matters just how we are. We live in a society and that determines our ability to be clever or to be stupid. It's not an individual thing, it's not an individual attribute. Knowledge, learning, being clever, being stupid, it's worked out collectively. People in more unequal rich countries are, on average, more stupid a little bit more often. We've seen this anecdotally. Uh, apologies to Americans in the audience, but you'll know the stereotype. Americans are more likely to be brass and say things that seem a bit more brass and that haven't thought about what they're saying. It's not Americans' fault. That's what happens in a more unequal country. When we loudly talk in cities in mainland Europe, we come over like Americans come over in Britain. It's slightly shocking to be told that if you think about it, because you think, oh, but we're ever so reserved and careful and subtle, aren't we? Um, young Europeans who live in London always comment about the class system here and just how obvious it is. It's not obvious to us, because we're, we're used to it. Here's a New Zealand website if you're interested in the work that Max did that made Toby want to draw those cartoons. They're trying to spark a debate about income gaps and the damage they do in health and narrow them. And about whether there's fair competition or unfair competition. And on the front of their website is simply a picture of a school in New Zealand. And if you know anything about society and how things work, and you've only got to know a little bit about New Zealand, the way New Zealand society segregates people into different areas and into poor schools and rich schools, they're actually called SR1 and SR10 schools, alters the future trajectory of New Zealanders' lives. Nothing innate in these children that means that they are less likely to do well in the future. It's the nature of New Zealand society as it is now and how children are funneled in particular directions. I'm going to speed up a little bit. Here's one more uh, cartoon to show you. I may be a bit too obsessed by my Toby at the moment. Those pie charts are about how many children a few years ago got five A to C's and GCSEs. Uh, the little one down the bottom is private schools. Send your child to a private school, then we're certainly going to succeed. They have to. People aren't that stupid, apart from in Germany. Um, you don't, you don't spend that money if you don't get the results. The comprehensive figures from a few years ago, only 39% are passing. The selective grammar schools and church schools, I think, are included there. Both of them are church schools, actually. The majority of children were passing five A to C's. And then the tiny number of secondary moderns, what's known as Texas secondary moderns in counties with grammar schools doing really badly. When you have selective schools the way we do, and they're becoming more selective over time, 
they tell pupils that they're more clever than other children. That's, that's what, you know, you've passed the 11 plus, you must be more clever. Children have got no way of knowing whether they're more clever than other children because they don't get to go to the other schools, so they believe it. They're then trained in how to pass exams, which really is a useless skill later in life. Um, and these are exams right at the very top. What differentiates a final honours student in Oxford from a final honours student in Sheffield is that the final honours student in Oxford will write 12 or 13 or 14 pages in one of their three essays in three hours. So that the poor sod marking it has to read an enormous amount of work. That's what the university I'm at in the social sciences trains them to do. They all know that they've got to try to get to that second answer book and start filling it in, because if you haven't written that much, you might not get a third. Teaching children to regurgitate dates and references as much as they can and write as fast as they can in exams in the summer, what possible use later on in life does that ability have? How we are treated really matters. And it's very hard for any of us to judge this because of course we're only treated in one particular way. I remember many years ago seeing Tony Blair, I saw him twice. Uh, the first time I saw him was a normal Tony Blair experience. He was being famous and everybody around him was smiling. Many people had only met Tony for the first time that day. Quite a lot of them didn't really like him but they were still smiling because that's kind of what you do when you're in the presence of celebrity. And I thought, what must it be like to be Tony Blair? And what happens to you every day is that you meet all these people you don't know and they smile at you as if you're great. The second time I met Tony Blair was the day he had to resign. And nobody was smiling, they were all looking a bit uncomfortable because the event was meant to be a bit different. Uh, and Tony looked very small and short and not very happy. Um, Pygmalion quote, the difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but in how she is treated. I just see this all the time. I see it when people ignore people around them who are cleaning up around them. I see it when people ignore the security staff as they walk into a place like this. And I see it as people pay a lot of attention to somebody like me and you put forward in this way. Uh, it changes what you think about yourself. And in a society where people are more likely to look up and doff their cap, more likely to look down at their shoes and not try and cause a fuss, that grinds on you, it has an effect. Um, I won't say anything about the sorting hat from Harry Potter, um, except well, I'll read it out for you, but uh, there's nothing hidden in your head the sorting hat can't see, so try me on and I will tell you where you ought to be. Uh, the sorting hat comes up with a different rhyme every year. Uh, the rhyme more recently has had some doubt into whether the sorting hat thinks the sorting hat is getting it right. Uh, or not. One more example of the kind of thing I get sent. I was sent a paper again last week titled Demonstrating the Validity of Twin Research in Criminology. Uh, you may not know about this because this is a talk about education, but in criminology there is a burgeoning part of criminology that tries to work out do some people have criminal genes that makes them criminal. Um, in fact, there's a famous New Zealand study of a very tiny group of people in Dunedin where this came from. So the idea is some of us are delinquent, some aren't delinquent. If we could spot the people with the criminal genes, maybe you could teach them to try not to be criminal early on or whatever. Now, being criminal or not is a product of your time and your place. We used to have hardly any prisons 400 years ago, and very little crime. Uh, we now have a prison boom. We have more prisoners here in England per head than anywhere else in Western Europe. That, I would say, is because of what's happened to our society. 
It's not that we have suddenly become more criminal or that the criminal genes have expressed themselves that our grandparents somehow didn't have. It, it doesn't work. In the US, there are two million people locked up in prisons. It's the highest rate in the world. There was only one year when one country managed to beat the US, and that was Rwanda, when they locked up all the people who'd taken part in massacres in prison. And then Rwanda only just got a slightly higher rate of people in prison than the US. There is nothing inherently criminal in citizens of the United States of America. Um, lost my this paper, demonstrating the validity of trim research and criminology, was attacking a paper that said that really looking at genetics for crime is, is silly. Um, by silly, I mean fraught with problems. The paper by some geneticists was very angry because the critics of the geneticists said identical twins are of the same sex. And so there will be a correlation between their outcomes because they're male and male or female and female, particularly for crime. Crime rates are incredibly different for men and women. In that paper, you can find a statement that says, where is the evidence that what happens to men and women is different? It's the most ridiculous. I've got huge volumes of books on my shelves about gender differences and outcome. Um, it's a really, really fraught, really fraught area. It's very, very bitter. But it matters because our previous education secretary, my, Michael Gove, really believed We are labelling children in ways that are damaged them uh, greatly. This is the distribution of ability of children in the Netherlands according to the PISA results. So if you've met the Dutch, you may not know, there's about 3% of them have almost no ability, 11% of the Dutch are limited, 20% have fairly adequate ability, 28% are simple, and it's not until you get so 25% who have some effective ability, this is age 15 or 16, and you get any Dutch person who is even slightly useful. And then you get the 11% that are developed, and then you get the super 2% advanced. Uh, PISA have dropped those labels since I did the first edition of Injustice. It wasn't me, other people said, what are you doing? They've kept the methodology exactly the same. But they no longer use those words. There's a lot of that going. I've got too many slides, so I'm going to go through them a bit more quickly, and I'll just let you read uh, the kind of things I say. But if you're thinking about what happens to children and how they do and how they develop educationally, just think about the economic environment of their parents. Between the 80s and before the crash, 6% of parents on average were finding it difficult to get by. Very difficult. 15% were finding it difficult. Almost half were only coping financially. So slightly under a third of us, for those decades, said we're living comfortably. If you're not living comfortably as a parent, doing all the kind of other things you're supposed to do to help a child is very hard. Let alone what happens if one of you falls ill, if you divorce, what happens to the kids then? Or if you're private renting and you've got to move and the kids have got to move school and again and again? 25% of kids in England are now living in private rented accommodation because of what's happened to the housing market. There'll be a higher proportion uh, in London. Circumstances matter um, so much more than their genes. This little tweet. Um, somebody asked the Mayor of London why you put your weirdo and his response on Twitter earlier this year was a mixture of my genes and upbringing, you know, I expect. Um, most people who do well wouldn't be so conceited as to say, I am brilliant because I have brilliant genes. It's a really arrogant thing to say, isn't it? Think about it. 
but there are people at the top of society in Britain, including the Mayor of London, who thinks he's brilliant, and thinks the reason he's brilliant is a bit of his experience, but his special gene. And this matters because these views are commonly held at the top of society. They are very well hidden, because most people at the top of society know that they'll come over looking very crass if they say, I'm afraid most of you, the reason you're down there and I'm up here is I just have better genes. <laughs> you know, that's, you, you don't, you don't play it. More stresses or more changes that really matter we should worry about. These are a series of studies over time. E each circle is a study, the size of the study is the uh, number of participants, uh, the date is when the study was taken, and the proportion is the number of, I think it's 15 year old girls who were clinically assessed to be depressed at that point in time. We have lots of things to worry about, and we're making life worse for our children in many ways, adding the pressure of making schooling and education more competitive, or telling them that some of them are limited by what's inside them, and some of them are going to be super. And if you're super, you've got to do really well. There's pressure at the top end of society as well as at the bottom. Let me just show you what piece is still produced. This is a, the distribution of ability in PISA tests from the 212 later. And look, they're all bell curves. They're all almost perfect bell curves. Amazing. The Netherlands, UK, the USA. Slight differences, and I really look at the changes over time. Ability distributed by a bell curve in all these countries. How can that happen? How can PISA have tested all these children and got something that looks as neat as that coming out? Reason is ever so simple. What PISA did and still does is test children and then they scale the results so they fit a bell curve and then they publish those numbers. So PISA are telling you that ability is distributed as a bell curve without telling you it wouldn't matter how children are done in the test, it will come out as a bell curve like that from that organisation. And it's dangerous. Um, and it, it matters because it can be hard getting through life and hard getting through society. This is the proportion of people taking Prozac in the equivalent in Scotland at the moment. I think it's about 13%, the equivalent of 13% taking it every day, it's a fine daily dose. Um, the black line is when the first edition of Injustice came out and it looked like things were at least trailing off. That's a ridiculous 10% of the population taking drugs that may took you away from yourself. You could get through life. I'm not against Prozac, it's just, wouldn't it be nice to live in a kind of society where you didn't have to medicate? Uh, to get through. And then, of course, the recession hits, and then we are up again. You can find worse figures in America. The worst I've seen there are in Los Angeles, and the very worst are in Beverly Hills, in the richest part of LA. So, this kind of thing is not just about the poor. Behaving collectively, and I'm almost at the end now, you'll be glad to know. <laughs> Behaving collectively. There are things you can do individually. You can decide not to smoke or to smoke, it's affected by your society, but not that much. You can decide to drink too much or not to drink too much. But you cannot individually decide that you're going to engineer your city so it's really easy for you to walk to work. You cannot individually get out there and pave the cycle lane along a road, unless you're very, very, very brave. But have a look at these differences. In the US, only about 3% of people walk or cycle to work. And in the Netherlands, it's almost half. And there is a weak relationship with inequality. That's the take of the 1% of the population. We can behave in better ways where we behave better collectively. I think this distribution is like it is, because some countries are better at controlling the rich than others. There'll always be a 1%. They'll always have most. The question is, how much do they have? Things go badly, badly out of control, as in the US, and 1% has got 
exceedingly well, and in the Netherlands, they've got it down to 6%. And a society that is good at controlling its rich is also good at working out how housing and jobs should be distributed, and it's a good idea to make it easy for walking cycles. But my reason for picking this up is if the ability of the Dutch really is so identical to the ability of people in the USA, how come they're so different in other ways? Potential really is about quality. The idea that some people have potential and others don't have potential is, is really about quality. This is a blog by Reclaim Schools uh, about what is happening in our schools now. The testing being introduced, the, the direction it's going in, and it concludes that this is intrinsically reckless. It allows the rich to imagine that their own wealth and status must be part of the natural order. And Michael Gove and his advisor, who I, let's not say sack, I've forgotten what happened to Don, Dominic Cummings, but it's rumoured he's going to lead, lead the no campaign for leaving Europe, so Dominic could be back again. They fell for this stuff. <coughs> And it's not, it's not good. Let's end with Tony Morris. Uh, Toby Morris. Uh, Toby's got a, another cartoon strip that I can't show you called The Tower of Inequality. Uh, and it really is worth looking at. But this is at the very bottom of the tower when he's asking, what can we done? What can we do? And then he produces a sort of series of things we could think about. And you could think about introducing things like a citizen's wage. You can do it at a very low level and then make it bigger. There's all kinds of things you could do. We tax people at less than almost every other country in Western Europe. So we have enormous scope to do things differently if we wanted to. But if we don't think there's any alternative, if we think inequality is high in all countries, and you've just got to compete to win a global race, and we don't know that other people in Europe behave differently and their schooling systems are different and they treat each other differently and they do not think that part of their society is to be written off and only a few people in society are so great that they can rule. If we just don't know any of that, then we've got no chance of doing all the things that are better. And I was going to quote from Stephen Rhodes in Times Educational Supplement from, I think it's last year. Policy makers and educators don't need genetics to help them make better environments for our children, what is really lacking is the political will to make better environments for our children. Last, no earlier this month, a group of primary school children in the Rose Hill Primary School in Oxford wrote to David Cameron asking him if he could help make sure that their boiler doesn't break down again because last winter they had to sit in their coats all winter in school because the boiler was broken. Those are the kind of things you need to do if you're going to improve education. My last slide. You can achieve so much more by cooperation, by setting people up for these silly competitions. We all have skills and we all have abilities. Being cheerful, pleasant and kind are some of the most valuable abilities of all. We need each other, we need to work together because none of us are that special. Some of us do have disabilities, and sometimes there are genetic abnormalities that give us disabilities. The same doesn't happen the other way around. The golden child doesn't exist. There is no point setting out in a great hunt, like you look out for the next Dalai Lama, to try to spot that child who should be taken up to the ivory tower, because one day they can do PPE, and Vernon Bognador will give them a first, and then they can become prime minister and will make the world such a much better place. It's a fiction and it's very, very wrong. We can easily get things wrong because we don't vary greatly in ability, potential ability or realized ability. And we can also get things right by repeatedly asking for others to help us, correct us, and tell us when we're going down the wrong path. Thank you very much. I'm Sharon Kowartz, Head of the Department of Education and Professional Studies. Um, I'm sure there's a lot in Danny's lecture that you would like to ask questions about. Um, 
things are progressing along the right tracks. And I wanted to say on behalf of the whole department how grateful I am and we are to Danny for such a brilliantly engaging and challenging lecture. And I would like to thank you and your father for writing it. Thank you. wise words. Um, we now open the floor for discussion. Uh, we've got some microphones, I gather, and uh, they are quite important in this room because although you can project forward very well, people behind you don't hear so well, so I would encourage you to use them. And could you um, give your name and affiliation uh, before you ask your question to, to Danny? And I'm going to take two or three questions and then pass it off to Danny, if that's all right with you, um, to keep some of the flow going. We have, uh, I don't know, about 10, 15 minutes for discussion here, and then there's drinks upstairs, so you can grab Danny on an individual basis and ask questions or comments to him at that point too. So the floor is open. I've got gentlemen back here and then. My name is John Edmonds. I'm a visiting fellow of this uh, establishment. Um, I was enthused and inspired by what Danny said, a little bit troubled by the response. Um, I know it's very difficult, very, very difficult, to contradict the received wisdom of the time, even if the received wisdom is absolutely wrong. trying to find a way of dismantling these extraordinary ideas on which so much of our existing government and their predecessors' education policy was based. I'm part of an organisation that campaigns against selection in education. The arguments are so well known, but are so ignored by those who see an interest. I think uh, we should thank Danny for what he said today. Thank you. Lady here. So I'm afraid, Ben, you're going to be running to the front and then back again. <laughs> keep you keep you fit. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Simone Aspis. I'm a, I'm a student at King's College, London University. I'm also a disabled student. And I also work in the Alliance for Inclusive Education as Policy Campaigns Coordinator. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about disability being genetic. And I think you know, a lot of us would, take, would, would question that and would say that disability is a social construct. So if you look at things like autism, yes, there might well be some, maybe some genes that might, you know, there might, there's a continuum of, ha of of um, this continuum of our genetics that might interact with the environment, that might cause some differences in how we behave, how we learn, how we perform. So therefore, and what and all these labels like autism, uh, ADHD, are all social constructs because they're all ideas that have come to be that are different from the norm because we have an education system that's very much based on examination on a um, factory. So I just want to put, kind of take that up on that because disability isn't, isn't something within the genes. It's, a social, it's, socially, it's socially constructed. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously from our perspective, it is really interesting what you say about the collaboration because I actually was, I took part in a debate on LBC where this whole thing around, you know, 
a person at the top has all the ideas and that people at the bottom, quote, quote, should be on minimum wage and that kind of thing because they're not contributing to the work, to, to the production. So I gave an example of like, if you, you, know, you could be the best chef in the world and have great food, but you know, no one's gonna come to your restaurant unless you have clean floors and therefore they're part of that collaborative process in order to have great food, you want, a, you want an atmosphere and an environment which your cleaners have to do. And I think there's a real issue about how we value those big, those differences of abilities and how we, and I think a lot of that does come from our economic structure. So when we are talking about hollowing out differences in terms, hollowing out the middle range of jobs, no, 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 we haven't hollowed out so, so, um, those middle range jobs. We've just underpaid, undervalued the, the people who traditionally have been low, who've been, who've been paid low, uh, paid uh, at a low rate. And in the context, that is kind of going back to our education system. You know, we don't talk really about the implications of segregated education for disabled children. So we talked about, we talk about the segregation of black children, we talk about the segregation, the impact of children with school free meals, but we don't talk about the, or the impact that segregation has in terms of the kind of equality of education and the value of what they learn in the wider society. Remember three questions. <laughs> I, I, I can I can do two. Uh, thank you very much for, for that at the back. Um, I have enormous self doubt about this. There are interesting things coming out of the enormous numbers of studies, particularly since 2010, um, to do with geekiness and so on. But I, selection, I don't think helps anybody. Um, so I agree with you. And also, one thing that does help when you're worrying about arguing against the accepted wisdom at the time is just to think back a little bit. When I went to school, we were caned. A corporal punishment was seen as a useful thing to do. It was banned in state schools, and later it was banned in private schools. And any adult now who took a cane to a child would be in court. Um, but at the time, and for decades, this was seen as a necessary and good part of education. And if you just think about that, you can see there's always, for every generation, there's something that you did that future generations say, how on earth could they have done it? And I think it'll be selection in our case, because you're so lucky if you get to go to school with everybody else who lives near you, and even better if you get to live somewhere which has a mix of people. Um, not least because you can go home after school and your friends are on the same street as you. Simple things like that. Yeah, I, I was unclear about um, disabilities. I'll, I'll give you an example, which is again my dad. Uh, my dad has a very rare disability that he didn't know he had until later in life. Um, he always had a huge fear of playing cricket. And his fear of playing cricket was that he wasn't very good at playing cricket, so he was out in the far field, and it was fine until occasionally a ball came, and he had to try and catch it, and he couldn't catch it, and sometimes he might hit him on the head. Uh, later on in life, he was tested, and it's found that he didn't have binocular vision. His eyes don't actually work together. It's actually quite dangerous for crossing the road, but as long as you know you haven't got binocular vision, you can kind of take it into account. Um, now, it may be genetic or not, or whatever, but it's... It is a disability not having binocular vision. Not huge unless they make you play cricket at school, uh, which they did. But the point is that we all have disabilities. Often we don't know what they are. Uh, what we don't have is special abilities. So almost all of you have binocular vision. It's normal to have it. You all have opposable thumbs. There may be somebody in Britain who doesn't have an opposable thumb, but in general an opposable thumb is a pretty useful thing uh, to have. But the fact that my father doesn't have binocular vision or that all other kinds of people differ from each other in various ways doesn't mean that my dad isn't a particularly useful person in society. It just means that you wouldn't want to make him a cricket player. You know, that's all. And it's, it's, I think that's, that's my point about disabilities. Uh, but it's often suggested that there are these 
special genes that give you special powers, a bit like superheroes. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work for selection. You have incredibly common ones. The really advantageous things, almost everybody has. But a few people don't have them. Some people will be blind. You can do brilliant things in life being blind, um, but it will be harder. Not as hard as being deaf. If you have to choose between being blind or being deaf, you should choose to be blind. Um, but you have to know a bit about being blind or deaf. To know that, and people who are blind and deaf can do incredibly more useful things in society than somebody whose eyes work and their ears work, but they're telling you stupid things that make society worse. Uh, uh, my name is John Richards. I'm uh, the head of education and children's services for the union, Unison. Uh, but I'm, that's, I'm not going to ask a question linked to that. It's just who I am. Uh, I used to be, I came here once, but I'm a former graduate here. And my, uh, funny enough, my, my twins, I have non identical twins who take part in the big TEDS test. So I have an interest in that genetics. My main, main question was having listened to both Plom in and hear the various sides of it is when you're going to start having a dialogue, because at the moment what it seems to me is that you have various, you know, the naturists versus the nurturists, and you've, you're throwing rocks at each other at the moment. So I wonder at what stage you're going to start having a dialogue about what is you accept from each other's. Uh, research and what you don't. You sort of started to touch on it there, but it does strike me there's a lot of rock throwing at the moment. I wonder what time to get involved in the dialogue about what's useful. Hello, my name is Catherine Rayford. I work for the Department for Education, although I was a social researcher previously. I've got a very simple but tricky question, which is um, what are the policy changes that you think we need? <laughs> Hello, I'm Simon Clifford. I'm a, I'm a school governor. I'm also a Conservative councillor and association vice chairman. Um, and, and actually, it, it's it, similar to that, actually. Um, I mean, picking up from from Premier's speech tonight and also the 1% speech you did at the RSA. Um, in, t in terms of the increased inequality and the problem therein, um, and also uh, with reference to the point you made about you know, we're, we're a fairly low tax nation, uh, do you think we're coming close, with, with the inevitable radical change in employment over the next 10, 15 years uh, because of automation, um, do you see that we're reaching a tipping point in terms of public awareness? Because I was at uh, I was at a speech uh, last week at Brian Cox, and I asked him about whether he uh, believed that the the increased awareness of science and its importance uh, was understood at top level within within government, and he recognised that it was, but government was telling them that they didn't think there were the votes in it, and I think that's reflected in this subject too, that both science is is our way forward, but also addressing this inequality issue. But if people don't come out vocally and support it. Uh, and vote with it, uh, the change won't happen. And do you think that, do, do you think we're reaching a moment of change where, where people will demand this change? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yes, there needs to be more dialogue. That was me trying to be diplomatic, uh, you know, which I'm, I'm not enough. I did a review of, of uh, GS for Genes in the International Journal of Epidemiology less than a year ago. And the authors were invited to do a reply and they haven't. So it's an attempt. The best place to do your dialogue is in academic journals because there's referees and somebody calms you down. You know, this is not a good environment for doing dialogue in with an audience of other human beings. Uh, academic journals are the place to do these kind of things in. They can still be very childish and heated even there, but at least there's some space and some time. So if you remember the Spirit Level book, uh, it had a series of critics and the critics refused to do their criticism in academic journals back. They just wanted uh, to say the spirit level was rubbish. One of them is also somebody who, who loves smoking and doesn't believe it causes cancer. Um, but it needs to happen. It will increase because of this huge increase in genome-wide studies, uh, which again, the stats was developed in 2010. Most of the publications are 2014. There were lots of interesting little effects being found out about geekiness. They're much smaller, about an order of magnitude, 10 times smaller than the effects that twin studies are finding. Twin studies folks say 
that twin studies are the gold standard and find all these kind of things that genome wide analysis can't find. Um, but this is going to change and, it, and it's been so recent. We do need uh, to talk. The other thing is if you look over time at the twin study claims, they kind of go from three quarters is genetic to half to less over time. There's more things. So it's, it's going down. And we should be able to learn things from twins. But like I say, most of all, how people are treated by how they look. You know, looks really do matter in our society. Policies, small and gradual. <laughs> you know, so if we don't do revolution here, um, we don't need to be spending 240 million opening, opening free schools in areas where there is no need for new places. Um, the, you know, you wouldn't think we had austerity, would you? If you could, you know, there's a whole lot of ways in which we're spending lots of money and baseline tests for four and five year olds. We don't have lots of spare money. Spending money on unproven things, uh, you know, that's, that's an immediate thing that we could do uh, which would be better. The other thing I, is I would look at the effects of children at the supposed top of these distributions of uh, what is happening because I think it is harmful for children to be constantly selected as, doing, as supposedly being brilliant. It just puts off the year in which you finally have a fall and fail. Um, Life isn't rosy amongst the kids who get A star, A star, A. Um, and if we were to look a little bit more about the disadvantages of this for the ones we think do best, which will include a disproportionate number of our posh people's own children. If we look at the self-harming rates amongst girls, other things that are going on, we're actually damaging the children of the upper middle class. I can be even more brutal about it. Um, at a particular public school, which I won't name, uh, which I was at a few years ago, the gardener, who's a lovely man who couldn't stop talking, was telling me about what happened to the boys and how they were made to work all the way through till at 10 at night. If it hadn't been an expensive public school, you couldn't treat children in that kind of way. You can get an A star out of almost any boy. Um, but I do wonder what damage you do forcing every boy at 18 to get an A star at A levels if their mum and dad have got a huge amount of money and get them in. So I'd look at that for policy um, and look to Scotland and look a bit to Wales and don't keep on damning it and saying its results are awful. Uh, look at the positive side of, of, of what's happening in Wales. Look to Ireland for a better way of admitting children to university after they get their results. Um, and then look to the whole of mainland Europe. You know, it's not that the advantage of being the most unequal place in the world with some of the lowest stability and numeracy um, is that there's lots of places we can look for lessons. Lord knows what they do in Finland. I mean, where do the Finns go to learn about? I mean, they look at Shanghai, but even, you know, in Shanghai they're pulling out of PISA uh, because they're worried about the damage it does. And it's only, of course, a small proportion of the kids who are in the study. It's the posh kids who count as, as resident. And just like those boys at 18 in that top public school, you can get high PISA results out of a set of 15-year-olds if you teach them maths in a particular way. But it doesn't teach them maths. What, maths, I, I won't, I think I was slightly better at maths than my dad thinks I was. Uh, but maths can be really enjoyable and imaginative. But doing well in maths tests is not the way you learn what is really exciting about maths. Uh, tipping point. We don't, it's very hard to predict. Our inequality levels are now back to where they were at the last maxima, which was around about 1913. Um, our inequality in voting, uh, our segregation in voting is actually back to 1918 levels. Uh, that is, the Conservative Party are most popular in the Southeast. They're very, very unpopular in most of the country. So if you were to use the past, we are numerically at a position where we were at a tipping point before. Uh, we became much more equal for 70 years after then, but a war helped, and a little revolution in Russia kind of frightened people at the top of British society, who became quite radical and invented a welfare state and so on. Um, the reason to think that we may not get a tipping point is that as a country becomes more unequal, the numeracy ability of its population actually drops. The US is worse than us, but we're worse than almost everywhere else. And people's ability to work out what's going on gets worse. So 
So if you ask people what you think their children's chances are of doing really well, the more unequal a country, the more likely people are to say, my children are going to succeed and win. And they want to get rid of things like inheritance tax because they think their children are one day going to pay it. Um, so we become collectively more stupid as we become more individualistic. And we, 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 we find it you know, hard to work out basic things. But the situation we find ourselves in at the moment, only one in four of the electorate voted for the Conservative Party. It's the most incredible geographical distribution ever. I think this is the most undemocratic election result in the history of democracies. I'd love it if one of you can find me an election where a quarter of the electorate has managed to get an overall majority of parliamentarians anywhere in the world. They don't quite manage it in the States because they only have two parties. So even having only just over 50% of people voting in the States still means that the, pres the president gets at least 26 or 27% of the electorate. Um, so we've managed to beat the United States in being more, more undemocratic. Um, there's nothing set in stone at all about our politics. Um, it's, it's really unpredictable over what's going to happen. And there's nothing set in stone about our economy. Uh, our economy is still based on banks. It's still based on the massive debt that we have. Uh, it's still based on the idea that we are selling an expertise in something we're not very good at for the rest of the world. It's still based on a really dodgy little currency called sterling that occasionally people decide to play with and cause a run on. That hasn't happened for a long time. Um, if the Scots had, if just 5.5% of Scottish people had voted differently a year ago, you'd now be facing Scottish independence. And can you imagine how different that would then be for England and how different it would be for Sterling? What's Sterling like, not even backed up by oil? Um, we're going to see, we're going to sort Greece out, of course. Greece was just being made to go through an enormous amount of pain so that the Portuguese don't try it. Um, but if things do go badly wrong in Europe, and Andy Haldane, the deputy um, executive of the Bank of England, or what, he keeps changing his job title, but Andy Haldane goes around the world saying how unsafe our banks are. We cannot predict the next five years. 2008 should have taught us one thing. The completely unpredictable can really happen. You can have uh, rises in absolute poverty. You can bring back soup kitchens. Now, if you told me in 2006 or 7 that within five years' time we'd have millions of people collecting food to feed other people, we'd have government cutting most from the disabled, we would have absolute rises in child poverty, and a prediction from the IFS that under every single measure of child poverty it is destined to go up dramatically by 2020, and that we were going to take child tax credits away uh, from, I could go through it. If you told me all these things in 2007, I would have said, no, there's, there's, there's no way that could happen. So I think what we must learn from what has happened in the last five years is that there is absolutely no certainty for the next five years. Um, and what we need to do is to start talking about what we want. What kind of society do we want to live in? Particularly, what kind of society do we want to live on, live in if we are not that rich a country. And if you are not that rich a country, you cannot afford to have people driving their children past other schools to other schools. You cannot afford to spend huge amounts of money on some children and not on others. You can't afford to be doing all these tests all the time. It costs money, apart from anything else. What kind of country do you want your children and your grandchildren to live in, particularly when you take a slightly smaller share of the world's wealth than we've been used to taking because we were only a hundred years ago the richest country in the world. Thank you very much, Danny. I think, Ben, um, I think we're going to stop the questions there, the formal part. I'm hoping we can stay with us for a few minutes for drinks upstairs, so the drinks are up in chapters. Um, Danny's really made us stop and, and think about what we care about and what our responsibilities are in terms of addressing these 
inequalities within our society, and I, I think we should all thank him again for that. Um, we just have to show that we are um, equitable in terms of gender. We've got flowers for you, which is lovely. his Athena Swan officer for his department, so it's wonderful to give him flowers, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Sharon for very wise uh, thoughts on how we take what Danny's been talking about this evening and translate it into our, our work, our studies, our research, our teaching here at King's. So thank you all for attending and please join us for a drink upstairs, thank you.